I'm Ken Campbell, and here in my shed with all this paraphernalia, I'm going to recreate the experiments which change the world. This funny donut thing changed the world. It gave us electricity. I wanted to find out how. Hi there. The chemical history of a candle. Oh, yes. Immediately, a sensible effect on needle. I'm going to relive the great donut experiment and tell the story of the man who did it, Michael Faraday, the first working-class hero of science. Michael Faraday was born in 1791 near the Elephant and Castle in South London. It was called Newington then, but it was still the wrong side of the tracks. Life was tough for the Faradays. Just before Michael was born, the newly invented steam-driven machines of the Industrial Revolution had put his father, a Yorkshire blacksmith, out of a job. So, like many others, he'd brought the family to London in search of work. Somehow, they eked out a living. He was a newspaper boy. Then he got came to the attention of the local book binder who, who worked and lived in Baker Street and started binding, helping bind books, which he read. These are notes Faraday made from the books he helped bind. He was already fascinated by electricity, with strange natural phenomena like lightning and electric fish. He was a boy of infinite curiosity. I mean, there was a childlike quality about Faraday, wasn't there, all his life. Electricity was the great mystery of Faraday's youth. What was this strange power that appeared during storms? Even more intriguing to the young bookbinder was some recent news from Italy that would set the course of his life. They had found a new way of making this electric stuff artificially. Here in my garden with Dr. Bryson Gore, I am about to relive the gruesome discovery of the battery. And a scientist in Italy called Galvani was studying frogs and frogs' legs, and I've got one here. Let's just pop it up. This is a yeah. dissected frog's leg. And he was studying the nerves in a frog, and yeah. in order to move them around, he had a little wire hook through them. And yeah. he noticed that if the frog was sitting like that, and you took another piece of wire, and you touched from the top to the leg, There you go. Oh, yeah. You just have to find it. Oh, yeah. there you got it there. Yeah. Hi. Oh, there we are. Yes. Oh. Ah. And what Galvani felt was that this was almost residual life in the frog that was producing the electricity. Fortunately for the frog species, someone else realised that the electricity was coming not from the frogs, but from the wires. You need two different wires, and this is what was spotted by another scientist called Volta. Now, what Volta went on to show was that really it was the two bits of wire. You didn't need the frog. Back then, no one understood the chemistry of this. All we knew was that when metals like copper and zinc touch, they produce electricity. And soon, we started making batteries. This one's 200 years old and is the one Faraday used in many of his experiments. Each of those is a piece of copper and a piece of zinc touching together. And here we'd produce one, two, three, about 20, 30 volts. Mm. one or two volts from each pair of plates. Mm. This was a revolution. Mm. The amount of electricity that these could make flow 
was thousands, tens of thousands of times more than anyone had been able to do before. But no one knew what to do with all this flowing electricity. It would have remained a scientific curiosity had it not captured the imagination of Michael Faraday. New scientific discoveries aroused huge public interest in Faraday's day. To find out about them, people came to Albemarle Street near London's West End. This is the Royal Institution, a sort of scientific theatre where the latest breakthroughs were performed on stage in front of a paying audience. If the Royal Institution was a theatre, its star was Sir Humphrey Davy. Brilliant scientist and charismatic showman, his charm was legendary. And his audience was made up of rich women whose subscriptions paid for much of his research. Davy's lectures here resonated widely. Uh, he talked about mastering nature, about it being useful, about uh, there, was a, there was a sexy kind of rhetoric of reaching even to the bottom of the sea and uh, penetrating to the bosom of nature. Uh, and um, the, I think there really seemed to hope that with a new industry that was going on, uh, life could really be transformed. Then one day, by sheer chance, wannabe scientist Michael Faraday got hold of a much coveted ticket to see the great Davy. One of the people he was binding books for, one of the customers uh, in the shop, uh, was a member of the Royal Institution here, uh, and therefore had some tickets uh, for the lectures. And uh, he offered Faraday the, the tickets. In the spring of 1812, Michael Faraday took his seat in the gods at the Royal Institution's Theatre. The rest of the audience, who were mainly from London's elite, were completely unaware of the 21-year-old who sat behind the clock in the middle of the auditorium. They had come to enjoy the show, and that night, Davy did not disappoint. What Faraday saw that night bowled him over. Now, more than anything else in the world, he wanted a job as Davy's assistant. He came up with a plan. He would make detailed notes on everything Davy said and did and use his bookbinding skills to turn them into a beautiful present for Davy. Wire was introduced into the job.